Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Rod Kumar. I am the president and editor in chief of DevX coming to you from my home. Like so many others who are joining the call, I want to thank all of you for joining us from all over the world. We're streaming live on YouTube right now. Uh, and we're going to have a, a discussion on what to me is one of the most important topics in the world, but one that is really not getting enough attention today, and that's the nexus between conflict and the pandemic. Uh, if you look at a map, of the pandemic of where the COVID-19 cases are around the world, you will see that there are about 4.3 million cases or so, and they are spread largely in advanced economies. Uh, and a lot of the news as a result is about what's happening in places like New York or London or Northern Italy, understandably. But what epidemiologists will tell you, what they've told us at DevX is the case counts are rising in many fragile countries and many conflict-ridden and the situation in many of those places will get worse as time goes on. We, of course, hope it doesn't, but there is a likelihood that this pandemic uh, will reach many, many other parts of the world where today it may not be as prevalent. And the big question is, what do we do about that? Um, what's going to happen? And what can the international community do to prepare and reduce human suffering and make sure countries that are making progress don't backslide? And we have got an exceptional group of people to, uh, to get us into this conversation today, a conversation that's brought to us by the U.S. Institute of Peace and the World Bank Group. And uh, I'm really delighted to be asked to moderate the session today. And I, and I really want to call out to all of you who are joining us from around the world. We've had a huge response to this topic to please, um, to please show us uh, exactly what, what you think we ought to be talking about. Ask us questions, provide comments in the stream. We'll try to get to as much of it as we possibly can. Um, I want to just mention who here is, is with us today. We've got Nancy Lindborg, the president and CEO of the U.S. Institute of Peace, Mr. Axel von Trottensberg, who's the managing director of operations at the World Bank Group. We have Lamis Aliriani, who head of monitoring and evaluation for the Yemen Social Fund for Development, Lokok, who is the UN's humanitarian chief, and Minister Samuel Twe, who is the Minister of Finance and Development Planning in the Republic of Liberia, uh, really an exceptional group. Thank you all for making time to, to talk about this today. And I've just asked each of our, our participants to kind of go through and give us a couple of minutes of their take on this topic. And I want to start with Nancy, uh, who, who, as I mentioned, is the president CEO of the Institute of Peace, but she really led uh, the U.S. government's humanitarian efforts um, as a humanitarian chief at USAID for a number of years. She was involved in many crises that happened during her time there. And at USIP has put together a task force um, on fragility, global extremism, and has really advanced the new US policy on this topic. Uh, so Nancy, I'd love to hear your take on the situation now on this nexus between conflict and the pandemic and, and how you see it. Thank you so much, Raj. Uh, and let me add my welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. And as you said, Raj, a perfect group of panelists to talk about you know, what we're seeing uh, has been devastating for advanced economies, and we're now looking at the specter of pandemic taking hold in more fragile countries. Um, USIP works extensively around the world with a focus on fragile states. And as we know, 1.8 billion people live in those countries where poverty is con concentrated, conflict is more prevalent, weak health systems, fragmented societies, and most of all, deep mistrust between citizens and our governments, and all of which makes them far less resilient at the society level, at the country level, to the battering ram of this pandemic. Um, I led the USA Task Force on the Ebola response in 2014, uh, where I worked with Mark Wilcock, uh, and uh, we saw how that disease ravaged through three West African countries that were just emerging from conflict. And I'm pleased to also have with us here today the Minister of Finance from Liberia, uh, Minister Toya, who will have some observations. But that effort left me with three indelible impressions, which I believe hold true today as well. And the first is that when facing a pandemic, number one, citizen trust in government is paramount. Uh, there needs to be clear and factual information that helps people uh, understand and believe the critical life-saving messages that are given, behavior changes that can mean life or death. Um, this is as important as the health interventions. The second is that security is health. 
but security forces can be either an enormous help or a blunt instrument that exacerbates mistrust. Uh, okay, I'm gonna turn my video off. I understand it's shaky, so I'm going dark, excuse me. Uh, and uh, we saw in 2014 when the government tried to enforce a lockdown in Monrovia that erupted into riots. And we're seeing that it's happening now where heavy handed police responses to those who are stuck after curfew uh, in places like Kenya uh, are greeted with uh, repressive heavy handed responses. And the third reason is that international cooperation is essential. Uh, the world came together to contain the Ebola crisis in 2014, worked together with a common strategy, uh, with coordinated efforts that brought to get together contributions from around the world. So that outbreak in 2014 never became a pandemic. And I am constantly reminded that all the public health officials said at that time that we were very lucky and what they feared most was a lethal airborne disease which is what we have now. And as terrible as this has been uh, as a disease in the more developed world, we're looking at a multi-dimensional devastation in more fragile countries, political, security, economic, and health consequences. As Raj said, all intertwining to have really devastating effects. And I know our colleagues on the panel will talk in great detail about how the pandemic is ravaging these uh, fragile countries where we risk losing precious development gains. And it took two and a half decades for 700 million plus people to lift themselves out of poverty. And COVID-19 could push half a billion back into poverty in a fraction of that time. With the lack of remittances, interrupted supply chains, shuttered economies, weak health systems, all of this contributing uh, to even greater poverty and more fragility and conflict. So I wanna end with, like all crises, there are opportunities to seize. And what I really hope we can talk more about now, and as you were mentioning, Raj, there's been this remarkable convergence of ideas over the last several years on how to more effectively address fragility, fueled by the growing evidence that without more inclusive, legitimate governments, our development investments are less likely to result in sustained gains. We will be less successful in combating this pandemic and less successful in recovering if we don't take these strategies under advisement. There are many wonderful new strategies, including the World Bank. Congratulations, Axel. I look forward to hearing more about that. And importantly, the US passed in December the Global Fragility Act. And the act directs the US to work in fragile states in cooperation with the international community to support locally led strategies that integrate political, security, and development efforts and reinforce mechanisms for accountability, transparency, and inclusivity with the goal of strengthening state society relations. And in short, strengthening the core governance functions without which we cannot recover, we can't sustain our gains. So the global needs before us are absolutely enormous and the opportunity is to direct these needs in a way that can have longer term, more effective impact at a time we need it more than ever. Thanks, Raj. Thank you, Nancy. I think you laid out a great framework to get the conversation started. Um, you know, and as you say, uh, for a long time, you've been beating the drum on this issue of prevention and resilience. And now here we are facing something that many experts predicted, but until it's face staring you in the face, a globe, a truly global pandemic is shocking. Um, and it's highlighting all the, the inequalities in the world. And many of the countries we're talking about just don't have the resources themselves. And they're turning to organizations like the World Bank Group. And I, I want to ask you, Axel, what you're doing at the World Bank Group many of these fragile countries that don't have the, the domestic resources, they can't, they can't uh, address this challenge entirely on their own. What are you doing? What's your fragility strategy look like at the bank? Well, thank you. And uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon or good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure that we have this discussion. And let me also thank the organizer for taking the initiative. This is uh, important. And, and it is important for, for two main reasons. First of all, 
everybody in most countries is busy with themselves. And so uh, people are looking at what uh, one can do at home. Uh, but uh, what we need to keep in mind is that unfortunately the, more, the fragile countries are going to be most effective because they are fragile, have weak structures. And when our new strategy was always emphasized, we need to understand the drivers of fragility. I think the driver of COVID is well understood. It increases fragility. And I think we should be worried about that. The second concern is, is the lack of focus on the countries that in, in a case of, of acute uh, crisis in the world, um, uh, uh, these countries need voice. They need to be heard. They need to be also seen that they are uh, struggling. And sometimes I think we captured this well. First, that poverty and extreme poverty will increase with this as a consequence of this crisis. And unfortunately, the concentration of poverty and extreme poverty is most in the fragile countries. So it's a fair assumption that this will increase. Secondly, these countries are the weakest with health infrastructures. I sometimes uh, 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 mention that if you are in a OECD country, you have 300 people per doctor. In some of the fragile countries, you have 70,000 people for one doctor. And that shows uh, you know, the enormous challenge these countries have and why we need to see how we can help uh, there. So what is in general with this type of crisis is we got to be uh, fast, we have to be uh, action oriented, and we need to provide massive support. And this cannot be like little trickle support and uh, the crumbs that are left are for, for the fragile states. So this is our challenge, our collective challenge. And uh, that means that we need to look that everybody needs to see what they can do, not only for the fragile, mind you, also for the low income countries. And what will the bank do? In the very short term, we have said we would um, mobilize a lot of health emergency packages. We are now at um, 60 countries that we have uh, uh, approved packages for, and uh, we will do another 20 in the next couple of weeks. We are, with debt restructurings, uh, approaching the 100 country mark probably this week or next week. So uh, we are so that basically countries can buy the PPEs, the, the, the medical equipment, etc. And we need to continue on this. Uh, this will be important done always in coordination with the national authorities, with the UN, with the Red Cross, whoever is engaged in this. But the main thing is to help on this. At the same time, short term is not enough. We have said we will do over a 15 months period uh, about 160 billion, of which two thirds will be coming from IDA and IBRD. In the case of IDA, the, 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 uh, the ambition is to have uh, well over $50 billion committed over a 15 uh, uh, months period. And uh, if, if IDA 18 is any measure, it's about 20 to 25% going to the fragile state. So over a 15 months period, my sense is a fair assumption that something in the order of, uh, of 10, $12 billion uh, is going to be destined to uh, fragile countries. But it is clear what our concern is that we may do some front loading for IDA and provide more resources. But what is after that period? Once we have, we will need more money. And it is uh, we, meaning the international community, needs more resources for fragile countries, for the low income countries. They will be affected disproportionately, and there has to be international solidarity. My concern is that there will be nice words, but enough, uh, not enough support. 
we need to ensure the real support. And it is not only for, the, uh, for, for health, it is for human capital, for uh, giving them a chance at least that they not, don't fall back into greater fragility and unfortunately conflict. That is the real risk. So that is what our common challenge has to be. And we have to pull together and we have to put our fingers on this. Therefore, I'm ha happy to join this uh, conversation because there will be urgency to act. It will need to be uh, seen that here, unfortunately, countries are disproportionately affected. We stand ready to do whatever it takes. We'll need to do that together. Nobody alone can solve it. So we need to work with the UN system, with the private, bilaterals, the NGO community, and uh, of course, uh, with the, the people in the countries themselves to see how we can best support them. But that commitment is there from the bank. My sense is it will not be enough that we do front loading of IDA and after that front loading, we don't have enough resources. We will need more and that we need to engage the international community with. Let me stop here. Thank you very much for that message, Axon. We will be absolutely getting back to this theme of financing and global solidarity. What does it really look like uh, but I want to bring Lamis into the discussion because, Lamis, you, um, you have been with the Social Fund for Development in Yemen for more than 20 years now, and your country has gone through a lot during that period um, and is really in a state of active conflict right now. And there's been just dramatic human suffering there for quite a long time. And now you lay on top of that this COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd love to just get your take on how you see this from that perspective from how you're seeing it in Yemen and, and what you think we should all be keeping in mind when it comes to, to countries that are suffering really, that are in the most vulnerable situation during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for having me on. I would like to start with a common statement that, that is being heard now in Yemen. Death from coronavirus infection is possible, but death from hunger is certain. Yemen has, as you said, Yemen has been in, at a war for uh, the past five years, posing the largest humanitarian crisis in the world with 80% of the population in need of humanitarian assistance. Now it is facing the COVID-19 pandemic. It is the most uncertain time in the life of Yemenis. As of yesterday, 65 cases have been officially reported with many more unaccounted mainly due to lack of testing. Just to give you an example, for a population of 30 million in Yemen, only above, slightly above 800 coronavirus tested tests has been, uh, have been conducted. In one day in Aden, uh, south of Yemen, more than 60 deaths were reported with no mention of their causes, except for breathing problem. Hospitals are unprepared and under-equipped. Health workers lack personal protective equipment and proper training. It has been reported that some hospitals have denied access to several suspected cases due to fear of a spread of infection. It is estimated that 60 million of the Yemenis will be infected with COVID-19. This is 55 of the population with only available in the country 700 ICU beds and 500 ventilators. Yemenis are at risk of not being able to access medical services they need. But also Yemenis are more exposed to COVID-19 as more than uh, 18 million Yemenis are food insecure and malnourished, impacting their health and affecting their immune systems. 20 million lack of reliable access to clean water to practice frequent high, uh, hand washing and ha hygiene. Such factors, in addition to the ongoing conflict, displacement, and limited social protection, leaves Yemeni, leave Yem millions of Yemenis more at risk uh, to, the, to pandemics. Yemen has experienced waves of cholera, but this pandemic is like no other as it is associated with loss of livelihoods. Food prices have increased, remittances reduced, and international aid is being cut. 
to note that remittances are vital source for Yemeni survival. Uh, some businesses were forced to close down, such as women hairdressers, wedding halls, adding to the economic strains and cutting vital source of income to many small businesses. Yemeni fear hungers, like many other poor nations, more than contracting coronavirus. Uh, we fear for our lives, but we have to go out and make a living. Authorities are asking us to stay home, but they don't provide us with food rations. This is from an interview on, uh, on a local TV. With this grim picture, however, there is hope in public and community actions. There has been an, an ongoing efforts since March for confronting the outbreak of the virus from various players and I would like to focus on uh, community actions. Uh, um, uh, Youth-based initiatives were formed in Aden to clean streets from flood and sewage waste. Youth initiatives formed in Sana'a for community education and providing economic support to impoverished families. In rural areas with the support of Social Fund for Development, which is the largest in, uh, national institution uh, for social protection and development. Communities are mobilized to take initiatives, including locally producing masks for their community members and youth providing awareness messages to their communities. Uh, SFD also with the support of its donors has been transferring cash into the hand of, vulner of uh, vulnerable households along with other uh, along with um, uh, along with suitable awareness the ongoing projects that we have currently is close to 50000 households and currently we are preparing to target additional 50 households with cash transfer for nutrition delivering at the same times health and nutrition messages and to educate family how to prevent uh, how to um, how to take a preventive uh, measures I think I have to stop here and um, back to you. Thank you so much, Lemus. It was an excellent uh, review, and I really appreciate you bringing to the table the idea of these first and second order effects of the pandemic, right? There's a health crisis first, but obviously it could be access to food or access to basic livelihoods that, that might be the thing that hurts people the most. In fact, we saw that experience in West Africa, uh, in countries like Liberia during the Ebola crisis, where it wasn't just Ebola itself, it was the second and third order effects um, that, that really hurt people. In fact, I was going to go to our minister. He's, he's gotten up for a second. So I'm going to go to you, Mark, um, the humanitarian chief, Mark Lowcock. You know, we, we had a message from Axel. He said, we need fast, action-oriented, and massive support. How do you judge the global community on those three factors at this point, Mark? Well, hello everybody, thank you. Good to be with you all. So, let, so the starting point for me is we have an exceptional situation, right? We have, a, we have basically a one, one in a century situation on the pandemic. And when you're in an exceptional situation, what you need is extraordinary measures. And lots of nation states have taken extraordinary measures. But my concern is that we're not really stacking up to the scale and the speed we need, this is a little bit too much business as usual when it comes to international cooperation. So we really need exponentially to increase the level of effort on, on um, collaboration. I'm hearing um, the story that Lamis told just now about more people getting the disease every day from dozens of countries. Um, most of them aren't being tested, but they're still dying of COVID-19. But what I'm hearing to an even greater degree is the economic side of this story. I think the disease is three to six months away probably from peaking in many countries, but the economic calamity is with us right now. And the combination of the global contraction and the lockdown measures lots of nation states have put in place is leading to a prospect we see of a doubling this year of people starving who will not survive and let they simply won't survive unless they get assistance to purchase or um, acquire food we're seeing a big spike in other disease related problems 
And uh, our projection is that, um, as Axel alluded to, we're going to see an increase in global poverty, that the proportion of people living in the most extreme poverty for the first time this year for 30 years is going to go up. And not by a little bit, potentially, potentially by quite a lot. So that's the challenge that is ahead of us. And the question is, how do we organize a, a better response? So the humanitarian system that I coordinate, the UN agencies, the Red Cross, the NGOs, is basically the responder of last resort for those places where governments can't or won't, won't act. And you know, the humanitarian system at the moment reaches 100 million people a year, including millions of people in Yemen and saves millions of lives a year. And we have a you know, we have an extraordinary $7 billion appeal out at the moment to do more of that in multiple places. And so far, you know, we've trained 2 million health workers. We have got testing kits and diagnostics and so on to 125 countries. We've replaced the disappearing commercial airliners across more than 30 African countries with a UN air service to get supplies and aid workers in and out. But that is the beginning. We need a big scale up. But because the humanitarian system is just the responder of last resort, what we need to do is reduce the rate at which populations are falling into that category where they won't survive unless the humanitarian agencies help them. And that's where I think the agenda Axel set out is so, um, so crucial. I think that the rich world which has invested $8 trillion in protecting the global economy, needs to invest about 1% of that in protecting, so $90 billion or so, in protecting the world's poorest 10% um, of the population. So they don't fall into that live or die humanitarian category. And I, my, my own view is about two thirds of that could be financed through the IFIs. It was smart for the world in 2008-9 to um, recapitalize the IFIs, but we need to do a whole bunch more now. And in particular, on the fund side, um, um, we need to make money more affordable for these fragile countries. The easiest way to do that is a big SDR allocation. But you, we need to do some things on the um, subsidy side for members, for, for borrowers accessing um, fund emergency resources as well. On the bank side, I think it's the kinds of things that Axel has been talking about across all the multilateral development banks, actually, but supercharged. So uh, I would be, I would personally be more aggressive on the front loading, partly because I think the price is cheaper if you act earlier. You try and contain the problem within the next one or two years to avoid a 10 year problem. But I, but I also think that um, the price of the money is going to be a problem for some countries. We need to find a way to be more generous on the, um, the debt, debt payment suspension side. I think that just as every rich country has had to rethink its fiscal rules, we're going to need to have a much more um, a different approach to fiscal space and um, debt sustainability in these poorest countries to recognize they'll need some more headroom. I think the, um, what the bank did in the last capital increase on, are starting very gently to introduce some differential pricing. I think we have to do more of that. I really like the stuff I know Axel is trying to do to hoover up unused funds in trust funds that, that um, shareholders have put into the bank and haven't been used um, in, in the way they thought might be used over the last 10 or 15 years or so. A lot of that can be unlocked. That doesn't cost the providers of those trust funds any money because they've, they've committed to it or provided it already, but it can be unlocked for different um, purposes. Um, but my core point really, Raj, is the smartest strategy is a big, fast, aggressive strategy to minimize the scale of the problem and its duration. And, and we're not going to get that on a business as usual mindset. We need something extraordinary. Thanks for that me message, Mark. And I, we can maybe untruth it right now with Minister Twea. Um, you know, you're in Liberia, a country that's gone through a lot as well in the last 20 years. You've had civil conflict. You've had the Ebola crisis seven or six or seven years ago now. Um, what are you seeing in terms of Mark's call to action here for global solidarity and for an aggressive response? Are you getting the response you would like to see? in terms of debt suspension and cancellation, in terms of financial inflows uh, from the, inter the international financial institutions, the IFIs, as Mark described? Mark, 
You're muted. Let me ask you to unmute. Yeah. Oh, you're so sorry. That's okay. We hear you now. All right, I'm muted. Okay, good. So again, thanks for the invite. Um, I think this is an extraordinary opportunity. Um, the, the Liberia's response has been all of society government with full involvement of our international development partnership. And so on the get-go, I would say the coordination across the multilateral, the bilateral, the donor community space has been massive. Uh, they've all come together. And this is coming on the heel of Ebola. Obviously, they were all here. And there were quite some amazing lessons that we've learned. And they wanted to see how we get ahead on this. Uh, so from the get-go, the president launched a preparedness plan. Liberia was around the first country uh, in this, on this, in the, in the continent, I believe, that began quarantining arrivals from highly infected European and Asian countries. Okay, so long before people took this thing serious, so quarantine started pretty much, uh, I think, uh, early February uh, with, with that because of Ebola. All right, but we are at a different stage now. Today, I think we have around 212 cases, uh, about 20 deaths, and so. The first thing we need to say. The impact of COVID-19 is not going to be health in fragile countries and in countries with fragile situations. The impact is going to be non-health. And so it's, uh, it's the private sector impact, it's impact on, on governance systems, it's impact on resilience, on health strengthening. It, it, it's, it's those kinds of impact, on, an impact on, on conflict propensities because of weakened fiscal spaces. This is where I think uh, the situation will be. So we're not going to see the number of deaths we're seeing in America and in, in, in Europe. Uh, even though some models have predicted that millions of Africans will die, I think those models are dead wrong. They, they, predict, they made the same predictions with Ebola. I think what has to happen, as some of my colleagues have said, is, is we just need to develop a new paradigm, a new framework of, of COVID and, and inculcate the key risk to fragile countries, some of which I was mentioned. For example, our, our growth will be negative this year. And this is coming out of a very difficult macroeconomic reform we've had to undertake in the last two years. And that came out of a difficult experience with Ebola. And so it's like, is there any limit to the number of crises Liberia can go through? You know, on mill departure exerted serious macroeconomic impact because we were internalizing a lot of the internal flows, resource flows into our macroeconomic framework. This was not sustainable. When UN peacekeeping troops leave, obviously the macro took a big hit. We had to deal with that two years ago. Inflation went as high as uh, 30%. Inflation is down to around 20%, but that high inflation has exacted a toll on the poor and the vulnerable. We had to deal with lost income over the last two years. Now we're dealing with economic uh, difficulty that's been through revenue losses, slowdown in business because of COVID, all right? Um, total revenue loss in the current budget year is around 2% of GDP. And we're projecting that in the new budget year, uh, we may get there depending on the, on the severity of, of, depending on the, I'm sorry, you know, this is some of the advantages of working from home. <laughs> depending on the severity of the, of the, the COVID response, the COVID situation. So the key challenge for, for the private sector, a particular I'd like to recommend, document here, the informal, undocumented private sector, the market women, the petty traders, those people who have to walk their wares daily to survive are paying a huge price in order for us to get ahead of this disease. So in a lot of countries, they've been locked down. We've had a state of emergency here. We're preparing for a lockdown, but they've lost significant impact. Already coming out of high inflation, now they're losing income. I think the response has to particularly address these people. I'm emphasizing this point because since they're not part of the formal system, we often tend to overlook them in budget systems, in planning. And so there's, a need, there's, a, there's always a tendency to just allocate a small amount of them. We're resisting that temptation in our engagement with the IMF and saying the vulnerable households, the these vulnerable people have to be taken care of because they're paying a price for us to get ahead of the disease. So that's a key thing. We risk substantial risk to household, agricultural households who will experience delay in planting or may not be able to plant. The Ministry of, Inter of Agriculture has put together a, 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 a corona response plan for food security, and, and we're working with that. Um, there's going to be risk to governance in all of these countries. Uh, Liberia has come uh, with an IMF-supported program in the last two years, incredible, amazing macroeconomic reforms. 
this risk being derailed, but as a government, as an administration, we're not going to allow that happen. So a lot of the things that's happening in, in, in COVID response is going through the national budget process or through an off-budget framework that is that is uh, in fully internalized and, and, and rationalized along with our development partners. We are aligning all of the support, whether it's World Bank, it's IMF, it's the USAID, it's the Swedish government, German government, all of these are support are going to target key areas. The key thing we want to emphasize here is that from Ebola, what we've learned is that we did not really prepare for the next epidemic in Liberia. The president has instructed that we don't make that mistake in COVID. And so there is a need that resources flow into the country. We strike a delicate balance between dealing with the emergency phase today and preparing the health system, for example, or the economic system for the next for the next crisis. There will be the next crisis, no matter what. It will be epidemic or an epidemic, whatever sort, there will be one coming up. Will we be prepared? And all of the stakeholders have agreed, and it seems like after Ebola, we still are not prepared in Liberia. So we're, quite, we're trying to incorporate these lessons. So the point is that as economic situations intensify, our difficulties intensify in, in fragile countries, uh, social tension will likely rise, okay? And they will manifest themselves in different forms. Land disputes, for example, in some in Liberia here, we've had a very difficult land situation and we've been able to work on that, but some of these gains could be eroded if economic situations uh, become very difficult, all right? Ebola may also complicate uh, some, I mean, Corona may com complicate cross-border situations here in the West African Mana River uh, Basin. You know, we're in a, in a hot zone where a lot of countries are going to elections and gaining their elections and their constitutional questions in Cote d'Ivoire. And so, I mean, we're preparing knowing that nothing, nothing bad is gonna happen in these countries, but the expectation is that if there are refugee situations, for example, and you have to deal with COVID at the same time, that is another dimension. And so we have to, we have to incorporate that in all of that. I think uh, some of the earlier speakers mentioned the debt situation. COVID induced economic weaknesses will aggravate Africa's debt vulnerabilities. As Minister of Finance, this is the biggest headache I'm dealing with. Liberia is moderate debt distress, but we have a huge stockpile of concessional borrowing in the last 12 years that are eating up substantial space such that the space needed to expand the economy and to take new concessional loans are now limited. Now, coming out of COVID, when we want to make that big jump, it seems that it's going to be difficult. And this is the, this is the situation that many countries are going to be dealing with. So the conversation around debt forgiveness, around debt, I mean, I don't want to say a new hippie round, but some kind of smart thing coming out of COVID, knowing the difficult situation fragile countries are going to be in, has to be the order of the day. And, and I think we're bringing that conversation to the World Bank, and I hope we can you know, we can press that case to the World Bank that we need to look at these countries. So right now, um, we're working with the bank here, uh, the, the, the World Bank here, to look at creative ways in which we can analyze the full spectrum of the country's debt so that coming out of COVID, we can, we can start financing projects that really have impact. Okay, I've made these comments a lot of time at my spring meetings, that it does seem that we talk about debt issues, but the portfolio selection problem in in loans, whether concessional loans or non-concessional, is a problem for Africa. Because it does seem that a lot of these monies go to agriculture and we don't see the impact. Now, if we're spending $200 million in agriculture and we don't see the impact, when crisis hit and we're food insecure, that's a problem. So we're going to a meaner and a smarter strategy to select a portfolio of projects and financings that will have serious economic dividend for the country. The key message is, is that in all of this, our experience is that, look, we need to strengthen the health system and not just worry about um, the, the, the emergency. We are learning from Ebola that the focus on emergency can come at a cost and we don't want to repeat that mistake. It's very important for inclusion of all stakeholders. So the government has launched an all of society, all of uh, government approach to this. Uh, and we've invited uh, members of the political opposition as well into the response. President set up a committee on food distribution to vulnerable households and opposition political parties are all a part of this. This is in the spirit of, 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 of engaging a new paradigm coming out of COVID. I think, uh, and, you know, so, so in short, um, don't forget about transparency and governance. And I think we're looking at that. Let's turn this up, this crisis. Countries have to turn this crisis into an opportunity to showcase that their systems can work that the macro systems can rebound, that their, that their planning systems are adapted to crisis. And I think we're trying to do some of that and ensuring that all spending is going on budget, 
but we are fully accounting for resources. The president has ordered that a full dashboard of all fundings received be made publicly available, and we're about to release that. It will show funding source, disbursement levels, and, 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 and economic impact, what it impact, all of that is going to be on the dashboard. And this is our attempt to be fully transparent and to, and to change the paradigm coming out of, out of the, so we can, we can learn some real things coming out of this crisis that it, it, one, it is, a, it is an economic crisis in as much as the health crisis in vulnerable countries like Liberia, in fragile countries, it is more of an economic than it is a health crisis. We need to strengthen our health system to deal with the next uh, system, and we, uh, next crisis, and we need to strengthen our economic systems coming out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. You, you and the others have put on the table a lot. I think a couple of key themes emerge for me. One is this issue of what is the global international response look like? You know, what, what, what is the financial response? And the other is the idea that it's the non-health issues that might hit fragile countries the most. Everything from food insecurity to livelihoods to maybe social disruption. Uh, you know, if you if you have extended periods where people can't get access to food and to basic services. So, you know, I wonder, there's a lot, a lot of direction we can go with this. We've got a, a lot of questions coming in from our audience, our live audience around the world, and obviously limited time. But I think maybe we can go to you, Axel, first, because the World Bank's been brought up a couple of times here. And on this first theme of the money, on the financing, uh, we've got this challenge where the international system has been set up with a humanitarian approach when there's an emergency or a crisis. And yet a lot of what sounds like is required are more infrastructure investments. You know, we're talking about food insecurity, we're talking about health systems. Are we going to be able to bridge that gap and get to what Mark is talking about in terms of an aggressive immediate response to kind of merge, take, take the, the ethos of the humanitarian world and bring it to the long-term development world? Do you think that's going to be possible right now? Well, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that differentiation between development, humanitarian, fragility, that has been breaking. Uh, and I think that is a clear recognition that we can no longer think in this type of paradigm. I think also certainly our new strategy uh, uh, emphasizes this. Uh, this was a world of maybe 20 years ago where we had so nicely, well, the World Bank only provides in post-conflict situations support. Well, that is, uh, is not the reality. And I think that has evolved. So I think that bridge we have crossed. I think where it is more important is that a, I, I, I do think that in, in most crises we need to be uh, fast and then basically that's what we are responding to. Uh, the, I fully agree what Mark is saying. Look, if you want to make a difference, you do it now. You don't do it in five years from now. And so that means you will need as an institution uh, 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 make uh, mechanisms more flexible, fast track uh, procedures. Look, at the end of March, we did within two weeks, 25 countries for health packages. That is, of course, normally never uh, possible because it takes you 9, 10, 12 months uh, to prepare. I think we should be learning from that. Uh, I think that we can do a lot of things differently, but in the time of crisis, it's even more so. But this is not enough only to, 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 to prepare the packages. We have also to help how the implementation is. I'm actually worried also that we may be very successful to, to, to organize the money, but at the end of the day, that doesn't matter as long as we don't make a difference on the ground, i.e. that's implemented. And there are uh, structural weaknesses in these countries. And so here we need to, to see how we can work across the spectrum to make sure that these things are being implemented, started with the health emergency. At the same time, we need this longer term commitment. And here we are, I think, between a rock and a hard place because the donor community is busy with itself. And they will be, be saying, well, why don't you burn first your, some of your money and then come back? The problem is we need assurances that we have the money. Certainly in IDA, we don't commit on the basis of, of empty promises. And as you know uh, uh, full well, we have uh, the world is full of conferences with announcements and pledges that sounds nice. And in case of doubt, you add another zero to it. And then what is the reality? Often it, it doesn't follow. I think we need to, to get to a realistic business that we basically say, look, this is absolutely necessary. And therefore I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that 
particularly for the French, I say it is, it is, it's the right thing to do for the countries, but it is also the smart thing for the the world because if we can uh, avoid another conflict, that investment is worthwhile. And uh, yep. so I I believe that we need to do that. We need to push very hard. Uh, this is also a moment for the multilateral community from whether you're sitting at the UN or in a multilateral development bank, you got to show what the difference is and that multilateralism can be key in, in helping this country. So it is a huge challenge, but we need to push ourselves very hard. Yeah, in some ways, a crisis like this is naturally leads to a sense of isolationism, right? Just of multilateralism, because you look at your own community and you say, I've got problems in my own country. And I think some of that narrative is in a lot of the donor countries. And you've seen big announcements, huge fiscal stimulus in countries like the United States, but nothing at that scale, nothing that would match that level of ambition for fragile countries. Uh, and as we've heard from many of you, if we don't make those investments now, things could get much worse, the bill could get much bigger. I wonder, Maybe I can get you into this discussion, Nancy, and then anybody else who wants to jump in on this theme. You know, Axel is talking about not just getting the money, but also how do we spend it? So far, debt uh, relief has been the main way we're going forward in many, way, many ways because it's the quickest, it's the easiest thing to do. We're going to suspend debt payments. Um, but of course, a lot of fragile countries may not be in a position to even spend that money effectively. Given everything you've learned, Nancy, about, about how we should finance in fragile countries, what are some of the things you'd like to see the international community do with a big step up in financing for these, these situations? Great, thanks, Rod. Um, that I think is a, is a huge, important question and I fully, fully agree with um, everyone's points on the multidimensionality of this crisis. And as Mark said, the need to be fast, big and aggressive, but as important as how much money and how much financing we're able to put together. It's what do you do with it? And you know, I think there have been, there's been enormous progress in the in the recent years on bridging that humanitarian development divide that that Mark and Axel both spoke spoke about. And it's been really important for having faster action, for being able to understand how those things knit together. Where I think we still have the challenge is understanding how all of that needs to be lodged in the political and security of these countries. And Minister Tuya spoke about this, about the need to have, you know, the greater legitimacy and transparency. And some of that can be addressed through the way that you structure the financing or, you know, compact approaches that you take that are locally led, um, where you have leadership at the, at the country level that is fully committed to the kind of inclu more inclusive approaches um, and Liberia was an early leader of the initiative known as G7 plus or the New Deal for Fragile States, which was which was a, 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 a initiative led by countries that called themselves owned the label of, of more fragile. But going forward, as you, you know, as Axel said, uh, you know, most most of the more developed economies are very focused on themselves right now. So it will be a big uh, struggle to get them to focus on how important it is that we consider this a global crisis and that the health of everyone depends on the health of everyone. You know, you can't have the virus, you know, still percolating around in some of these other countries and coming back to a resurgence. So, you know, this is, as Mark said, an unprecedented generational moment. It is uh, the kind that uh, a kind of moment that we have rarely to seize for a reset button to really think differently about how we apply the funds that we must raise to address this challenge. Yeah, in some ways it is an opportunity, as we've heard. I mean, this is uh, such a unusual, unprecedented circumstance that maybe we can get donor countries to really change the way they think and to think big um, for once. And so I, I wonder, Mark. I think you wanted to jump in on this, on this conversation. Uh, what do you see as the potential to, to really start thinking big? I know you've just released, as you and I discussed um, earlier this week, a new, um, a new request uh, for your COVID response uh, in the UN system of $6.7 billion. You've called for $90 billion to be unlocked um, for low and middle income countries. 
what, what do you think is possible in this moment? What do you want to see? Well, I, no, I think the 90 billion is affordable, frankly. I mean, it's 1% of the global stimulus. And the question is, um, who can play what role? And I think, you know, all of the international systems need to play a role. I, I, I wanted to come in on the previous question you put about, well, if you have money, how do you ensure it gets to people who need it? Now, the good news on that is the world has got scores of examples, even in the most difficult countries, of channeling resources through social protection systems, normally in the form of cash, so you can relieve people's immediate suffering. The bank had a terrific example of this in Somalia, a country which has very little by the way of government, but was able to channel resources using text messages, basically. And virtually every country in the world you can do that in now. So this immediate starvation threat and disease, killer disease threat can be largely dealt with um, through social protection systems. But that, but then what you need is investments to get the economy going again. Um, and these crucial investments that Nancy was talking about, about social capital institutions, you know, conflicts, instability have causes. They have causes and you have to address the causes, not just the symptoms. So you need a multi, multi-pronged approach, but that crucial short run social protection thing is doable. We, we, we know how to do it if we can unlock the finance. Now, um, why should the why should the rich world want to do this? The, 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 the argument I'm I believe about this is that this is a this is not primarily uh, a, a, an argument you have to win in terms of human generosity and empathy. This is about self interest. It's not just the virus that will travel around the world forever until we deal with it everywhere. There are other consequences of instability. In 2015, a million Syrians walked to Europe because they didn't think they'd survive where they were. And other global public bads emerge from instability and unrest. So I think we need to find a way to help politicians and policymakers and decision makers in the rich world elevate their thinking for 1% of their headspace to think about that longer term um, agenda in their own interest as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. These issues are intertwined. Let me just mention, for example, remittances. You know, if you see remittances going down, it might lead to more need to migrate. Um, you know, even in countries that don't experience conflict, um, and many of you have mentioned that poverty rates are going to be expanding at historical levels. You know, reversing a historic trend that could lead to more migration. So you could see many layered effects from this if you don't get ahead of it. Uh, I wonder if others want to jump in on these themes we've, we've brought up so far. Let me see if you want to add to the discussion. Uh, just I want to add that um, now Yemen is experiencing cutting of aid and reduction of aid. It's an irony that Yemenis now uh, are in need more than any other uh, time, and particularly on part of Yemen in the northern areas the majority of the people are residing. So it might be for some, some political and uh, reasons, but still people don't understand why, like for example, World Food Program is very vital to the life of Yemenis. It distributed food. Now they are announcing that they are going to cut their, uh, aid because their uh, donor country are not providing anymore. So this is a very, uh, very, uh, uh, um, very difficult for Yemenis. Uh, even ourselves, when we turn to our donors to to find a way to raise funding for uh, to confront uh, COVID nineteen, we haven't like um, uh, we are not. We are receiving a lot of sympathies, but uh, except like it's true that we have uh, coming now uh, one hundred million from the World Bank. Uh, that is being uh, will go uh, to approve in July for the social fund for development, uh, and also there has been a response, uh, a rapid response for Yemen uh, through the World Bank, um, uh, 26 million point six through the uh, WHO. But it's still not enough. 
a huge need in the country and an uh, and, and, uh, ongoing conflict. So it's a lot of, of what is going on in, in, in Yemen that uh, people uh, are suffering, but this uh, crisis is, is, is causing more suffering. And also, if we can see that the conflict is still continue. Uh, we were hoping that uh, a truce will be reached, but actually it is being increasing, it is ongoing and it's being increasing. We've, uh, we've touched on a lot of the questions that are coming in, but there's one for you, Minister Tway, I think that maybe you can help us address, which is about jobs. Um, you know, we're talking about a lot of countries, yours as well, that have rising populations, a lot of youth populations people looking for jobs under normal circumstances, then you go to lockdown, you go to you know, economic recession, you talk about the macroeconomic situation and how negative it looks. How do you think about the job market and how to create jobs for young people coming out of this pandemic? That's, that's the most important question here. We have to remember that the economic challenges we face today are COVID induced. They're not part of the normal business economic cycle. The world was talking groping toward recession before COVID, economic slowdown. There is a natural slowdown, recession and repression in economies. Countries have challenges that they're dealing with. Liberia, for example, is an undiversified commodity dependent country. We have that structural deficit. We've now been able to, to domesticate the source of production historically. You know, so we relied on inflows, large external investments, but these have not translated into the domestic economy. So if you have a disruption like COVID, and the thing I want to agree with is that this needs a paradigm shift. It's 75 years since we've established a multilateral institution. The, the, the reason we established them was World War II. That was an epic called watershed moment. COVID-19 is showing us, even we're hearing that the great economic recession of 2008, the economic impact we're seeing from COVID is even worse than we saw from 2008. So what this begs is, is for, a, for an imaginative rethinking of the nexus between humanitarian, between development and the private sector. Somewhere along the line, we've left the private sector in all of this development work. The private sector is supposed to take on a life of its own. Market fundamentals, free competition should exist. Incentives are there. This, this does not work in fragile countries. This does not work. I mean, several years of economic history have still has told us that in Africa, these things don't work. You have to catalyze the private sector. But how are you going to catalyze the private sector? Governments have to play a big role. But how can governments play a big role when governments themselves are fiscally constrained? And I want to bring this important element here. When you look at the debt structure of, of, of countries, Countries don't have the room to move into the private sector the way they would like to. There's significant electricity infrastructure gap, there's significant roads. Only seven per six or seven percent of the roads in Liberia are, are, are paved. Now, how will agricultural prosperity happen when we, we make investments in agriculture and don't make the kind of investment in infrastructure to relax that binding constraint? Uh, roles of power and then move on to agriculture. We've, it's all in, you know, it, it's a model. I think COVID is begging us to rethink job creation in agriculture, for example. This is where you can put a lot of young people to work, technology, but countries need the space. And I can tell you in Liberia, this fiscal space is extremely, extraordinarily tight, okay? So that, so that it limits the ability of the government to move on in these directions. So I think it, it looks for for larger resource flow and and, and on the part of multilateral agencies. That's a great point, uh, Minister. And, and that paradigm shift might even apply to the basic model of development. I mean, so many of the fragile countries have had a model of development that relies on uh, exporting commodities, natural resources, which are being hit really hard in a crisis like this, tourism, yeah. which is hit hard in a crisis like this, uh, bringing on light manufacturing, cheap labor, kind of oriented manufacturing, where the trends it looks like are going to be a lot of developed countries wanting to bring manufacturing back on shore. So there's huge headwinds um, that, that really argue for this kind of a, a major uh, response. We are running out of time. I'm told we can go a couple of more minutes and we, we've got a number of questions that have come in. Uh, so I wonder maybe Axel, you could give us another thought. Uh, you know, you've got a global uh, fragility strategy. How does that interact with your pandemic response, your COVID-19 strategy? So this is uh, actually uh, one of the topics that there are going to be 
discussed also with the board, because basically we need to think of COVID. At the same time, we should not lose sight of our longer term goals in general for developing countries, for fragile states even more so. So I think that uh, we have, of course, a risk that we are now getting into the short fixing of, of some of the problems and forgetting the longer term development needs. These development needs actually have become larger and more urgent. So I think that also as a development organization that cares about the long term, we should not throw that out. We should basically uh, embed the response of COVID-19 with the longer term needs. We should not compromise that we just say we are now looking for the next couple of months we need to have this longer term perspective, particularly now that poverty levels will increase and unfortunately also extreme poverty, it's more urgent than ever. And, and therefore, I think we, we need to, to, to integrate that. I think that's not easy, but I think we need, we need to really think about this, how to do this. Now, the other thing is, and I, I was in February, I, I visited, I had already questions how, when we are scaling up our engagement in, in the Sahel and, and in the Lake Chad or the Horn of Africa, how are we going to think strategically about this? Because there will be considerable resources. And I think this is now highlighted even more how we combine it with COVID and then making the case for actually uh, continued large flows there. Um, so this is something that, that will affect us. I think that, um, it, it, you know, we need to, to, to adapt, but at the same time, our focus. And then the interesting thing, sometimes the board said, well, your country strategies are no longer so relevant. I actually back to disagree. The, the core of our strategy is poverty reduction. And that has become even more relevant than ever. So it's more urgent. So the, the part what we are seeing is we should not forget, if you look at the SDGs, we're off track and we're even worse off track today. So that means we need as a matter of urgency, at least to defend the achievements that are key and, and so that it that doesn't get worse and ultimately get back on track. And we need not to have a short-term strategy of a band-aid approach where you, you do a little and you leave the long-term challenges unmet. That's unacceptable. You know, we're running out of time. I really appreciate that great message. So I'm gonna just ask Nancy to maybe give us a closing thought. Um, this is an event you and your team have organized at USIP. So I'd love to hear your, your take on the conversation so far and, and leave us with some parting thoughts, please. Thank you. And, you know, everybody made the important, crucial point. I wanted to add one example. Um, Axel mentioned the Horn of Africa. And, you know, to, to just underscore what Minister Tuya said about the, the convergence of the political, social, economic uh, needs and uh, the paradigm shift that we need. Minister Tuya, you, you talked about humanitarian development and the private sector and you know, the political dynamic absolutely need to be a part of that. Ethiopians are both undergoing historic transitions right now. Um, and they are in a region that is you know, food insecure in the times, very fragile, beset with all of these dynamics that everyone has talked about. And so the opportunity right now is to really move in with the kind of support that takes into account the political and regional dynamics. And I know the bank is working with some of the members of the states in the Horn and the EU to play some regional strategies. And we, we really need to look at what are the greater political dynamics uh, that enable these strategies take hold with both the immediate and the longer term events, uh, uh, results that both Axel and Mark have, have talked about. So my, Overall, I, I think the common theme that's emerged from everybody's comments is that a lot of people around the world are rising to the occasion, as was talked about at the individual, at the community level, 
Um, we're seeing institutions strain uh, to do things differently in the face of this just extraordinary, unprecedented global crisis. And we need to, we need to keep the pressure on to make sure that we do things as differently as with it and seize all these opportunities so that this is a moment of reset and we're able to break out of a lot of the old patterns and systems that are not serving us well and put in place some of the best ideas that we have already developed but haven't yet put into place. And so Raj, thank you very much and appreciation for everybody and all the work they're doing who've joined us this morning. I'm sure everybody uh, feels the same way. It's been great to see all of you and especially to hear all your voices on this issue. Unfortunately, not getting enough attention. Um, people are looking at the crisis as it exists today and not where it's heading. Uh, and we know where it's heading. It's, it's clearly going to have a huge impact on many of the most vulnerable people in the world. So thank you, all of you, for the work you're all doing every day on these issues and for highlighting for urgency, the need to focus on those who are most vulnerable um, and the need to think big. Um, I'm hoping we take that out of the discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining the conversation from all over the world, from wherever you are. Uh, thanks to the World Bank Group and USIP. It's been a pleasure to, to be part of this today. Thank you.